morning, everyone. I think we'll um, get started now. Um, my name is Saskia Broyston. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Una Social Business. And today I'll be your moderator uh, for an exciting session that I'm looking forward to here at SunCalp, um, the first virtual SunCalp session. Um, so the topic we will be discussing today is building resilience. What lessons are we learning from COVID for future shocks? So what are we learning from COVID for future shocks like climate change, the next virus that's facing us, the next financial crisis, a drought, a war, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we will be discussing. That's what, we'll, uh, what we will be discussing today. Um, we have a fantastic panel with us today. So we have Roshan Miranda, the founder and um, entrepreneur behind Waste Ventures, a fantastic social business based out of India that works with waste pickers to um, yeah, ensure um, they have higher incomes, waste is recycled um, and makes it from away from Indian streets. Um, his background is he used to work for the Boston Consulting Group and many other exciting things and then dedicated himself to this topic. So thanks so much, Roshan uh, Miranda, for joining us on this panel. If you maybe want to raise your hand so people know who you are, that's great. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you, Roshan. Um, we also have Kate Heider here from Root Capital. She's the director of innovation at Root Capital. She's based out of Nairobi um, and has been working with Root Capital for the last five years. Before that, Kate was a, a management consultant working on a variety of different strategic topics. Um, and yeah, now, um, as I can see from her CV, loves what she's doing, loves rock climbing and many other things. So Kate, um, if you want to raise your hand, um, please do so. Exactly, fantastic. Uh, the next person is Lakshmi Vishwanathan. She is the co. Uh, she's the uh, COO of um, the funds at Uno Social Business. My dear colleague, I'm excited to have you on the panel here, Lakshmi. Um, Lakshmi's background is actually similar to Kate's and Roshan's, also a management consultant, used to work at McKinsey, um, also at some point at Sodexo and has been working in the impact uh, investing sp space now for the last five years in various roles um, and now since over the last uh, two, three years at Uno Social Business. Um, and finally, I'm super excited to also have Rebecca Eastman with, um, with us. She's the co-founder of Greenwood Place, which is a philanthropy um, advisory um, working with many private clients based out of London. Um, Rebecca and I met during her time at um, head of philanthropy at uh, JP Morgan and working with many of their big private clients. And of course, before that, um, uh, she joined her, she actually founded her own um, NGO, so she actually knows the social side as well, as well as the philanthropy side, um, and thereby can also speak very well from the perspective of the funders. So this is our fantastic, oh yeah, there we go, please wave, thanks Rebecca, um, and so everyone knows who who is speaking. So this is a fantastic um, panel that we have in place today, and we um, will be able to discuss how funders, entrepreneurs, and impact investors have really adapted their own organizations, how far COVID is really changing the way that they work, um, and again, um, how they can use this learning to be able to um, yeah, project that to the future um, and how it will actually change the way they will be working going forward. So without further ado, I'd actually love to start a little poll. Um, and Tanutru, if you, if you could be so kind to launch the poll, because I would like to actually know about people in the room and how they feel um, at this stage before we actually launch into the, into the full-on discussion here. So um, the question that I have to all of you in the room is, have you made changes to your organization or business model due to COVID as of now? Have you already changed your organization is the, is the question. So if you could just um, answer the poll, I'll give you one, uh, I'll give you a couple, like a minute uh, to think about it in case you are still hesitating. We see that there's a, a, a competition between minor adaptation and significant adaptations right now winning. Okay. I think we're good. What we're actually seeing is that um, 
about 44% of the participants say minor adaptations. It's now up to 47%. So, so that has been like actually the, uh, the, the, higher, the highest number so far. We see 40%, um, actually now 50% are minor adaptations. 40% um, are significant ad adaptations and 10% are a full pivot. That's what we're learning. So clearly uh, nobody is thinking that COVID is not changing their organizations at all. All think it is um, having a change, um, but minor adaptations are currently the highest number that we see significant adaptations right after that and full pivot only a small number, but um, still a number that, um, that is, is existing here. Fantastic. So I think we can jump right ahead. And I'd love to actually start with you, Roshan, because you're obviously, as the entrepreneur, um, really closest to the action and closest to the impact that we all um, seek to achieve. So Roshan, I'd love to hear from you um, what you have learned from COVID or how COVID has actually currently um, impacted your business model and, and made you change things. Tell us about that, please. So um, thank you, Saskia. Hi to everyone. Um, I think it's for some of you. It's I, I don't know what part of day you are in. Uh, it's it's you know. Thank you so much for joining. You know, despite being night or afternoon or more early morning, I appreciate this and, and pleasure to be talking to all of you. Um, so we have had. Um, I mean, we fall somewhere between minor and major adaptations uh, category, and I see that you know almost fifty percent of you guys had to make major adaptations and then possibly pivot completely. Uh, we considered pivoting completely uh, into some of the segments which we have never explored, uh, but then realized that, you know, yes, that was not necessary. Our business could continue with uh, sometimes in some certain segments, minor ad adaptations, in certain segments, major adaptations. Uh, one thing that definitely helped us, um, so to give you a little bit of, you know, what I'm talking about, uh, you know, at Waste Ventures, on a high level, we work with around 1,600 waste pickers across Hyderabad. Uh, we collect waste from them that they otherwise would not pick up uh, and provide that stream of recycling uh, for them. So, you know, it provides both environmentally positive impact as well as helps them earn some extra extra revenue. Uh, we have now increased that network to 6,000 of them. Uh, that's been a fantastic adaptation that we have had where we could increase that uh, network. And, you know, it's, it's through another uh, initiative that you've worked with. I'll come to that. Um, apart from waste pickers, we also work with corporate clients who give us waste. Uh, that has been majorly hit because COVID has kind of put stop to any kind of office work. Uh, now, what has happened is these people are actually were you know kind of consuming the same amount of waste in the household setup, uh, but household wasn't uh, you know though it was a good business line for us, it gave us some revenues, wasn't a most profit making one. Uh, we struggled there to make profits, so that has kind of increased a little bit now. Uh, and while we work with waste pickers, we also used to work on extended producer responsibility in the waste management space, which helped us quite a bit and it's continuing to help. Uh, so as, as I see, the COVID has taken away certain business lines completely, uh, where it used to give us good profits and good revenues that has completely gone, uh, but a certain segments have actually done better now because they continue to exist, waste continues to be produced. Um, and certain segments we had to pull up because you know we had to provide support and pull up um, and because we were kind of uh, freed away from one of the business lines, we could kind of focus on other ones which are giving us. So this kind of having multiple portfolio of clients helped us kind of stay focused and kind of stay alive uh, during this time. Yeah, that, those are the kind of, we have made certain changes to certain business lines and having that diverse portfolio helped us quite a bit. Okay, fantastic, yeah. And also in your pre in our pre-discussion, um, Roshan, you mentioned that, um, in some ways also extending your impact work, I would now call it, um, and working with waste pickers during this crazy times has actually helped you also set yourself up better for the future. Is that maybe absolutely. something you want to share as well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what we what we realized was that, you know, in the, in the first phase of shock, I mean, there's a reason why we call it a shock. There is no trend to go by. There is, there is no pattern here. Uh, it just comes as a shock. Uh, in the first phase of it, almost a month of it, all of us were kind of reeling with what's happening around us. We really don't know what to how to deal with it. Complete lockdown in India. We had to figure out how to get our you know supply chain to work and so on. While we were doing that, what we figured out uh, was that the waste pickers, of course, being the ultra poor or the most affected, uh, rather the most uh, typically end up getting affected the most, right? And they also happen to be essential service uh, folks too. So it was a very difficult situation for them. They were not getting recyclables, revenues from recyclables like they were getting before. 
that's a huge part of their revenues that was completely gone uh, but they were expected to go and then serve the city because they had contracts or other they were made to do it um, through the government efforts and so on and they were also getting exposed to this covid um, ended up what happened is because a lot of them were scared almost 70% of them left the city and went away uh, the remaining 30% had to make up for the you know for the people who even who had gone so and recyclables revenue not coming in and people not paying them as well they ended up putting them in a very bad shape and we did some philanthropic work uh, to kind of provide them meals uh, for around 200 of them and that went a huge success after which i think uno social business fund came forward and then said hey let's let's scale this up let's make sure at least around you know 5000 to 6000 of waste pickers get benefit of it now we are scaling this we have scaled this operation we are providing grocery kits to 6000 waste pickers this is the second month in which we are in uh, we are going to provide it for further two more months that's been fantastic now this philanthropic effort wasn't you know we are a for profit company we don't do uh, philanthropic work we are not an ngo but because you know we were not super busy in our business you know we could actually use the workforce to actually extend this operation and then do this during the covid time it was in our interest uh, business interest because the extended network of waste pickers now instead of 1600 now we are able to work with 6000 waste pickers uh, that's that's a brilliant expansion so we brought in a bit of flavor of philanthropy although it's not what we uh, typically do uh, but we brought in that flavor and extended our network now it's going to benefit our business in future and because of that our apr revenues have gone up uh, so this is where we had to give in some of course it was a brilliant social impact and i i, I know that's kind of very rewarding work uh, makes me sleep the happiest in last few months uh, but still uh, it, it was necessary even for the business to thrive right i mean it's it's uh, that's that's where we married that philanthropic work to business made sure that we end up benefiting from it as well um and you know to be you know it's 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 a different pleasure when you make 6000 people not go hungry a single day uh, that's that, that's just a different pleasure yeah i can imagine no russian i think those were really interesting insights so basically on the one hand you say diversification of your business units has actually been a very important learning factor and something that you also take uh, take into account going forward you need to have several legs on which to stand and the other one really the impact work um is actually important and can strengthen uh, uh your business model going forward i think those are two really interesting takeaways for me um with that i'd love to actually hand over um to kate um from root capital kate do you want to share um how has root capital's work really been impacted what are you learning already now from the crisis let us know how how yeah how agricultural sgbs are being um are being affected by covid currently great thank you saskia so maybe just a few words of introduction for root capital for those that are less familiar Root Capital provides both credit and also capacity building services to agricultural businesses. So it could be a coffee cooperative or an agro-processor. And we really invest in these businesses because we know that they can be engines of impact in the rural communities where they operate. Um, and so in terms of the last six months of, of this crazy year, it's funny how some things actually haven't changed. I would say that we've always known that these organizations are um, income generators, engines of impact, employment sources in the rural communities where they work. That's why we do what we do. And in the context of COVID, we've really seen that our our client businesses can be a lifeline for the communities that they work in. Um, I think they we've seen that they can both play a role in terms of reducing the risk of the virus spread and also managing its economic effects. um but they of course need support and so the question then becomes what is the right support that we as root capital can provide to our clients through this crisis in the early days of the pandemic around march um we did do a survey with about half of our client portfolio um and we did find interestingly that at that time only 20% or so of our clients were actually experiencing market impacts um from the virus but almost all of them were struggling with how do they adopt their operations the realities of shutdowns border closures new employee safety regulations and so as root capital we really needed to continue doing a lot of what we do we needed to continue giving working capital to our clients 
so that they had the financing they needed to pay farmers on time at the harvest season. We had to continue providing um, capacity building services on some of the core business management functions such as scenario planning, cash flow management. Um, but it, that is not to say that nothing has changed because a lot has changed. Um, you know, luckily we were able to continue providing working capital to some of our existing clients or clients that were already fairly far along in terms of the due diligence process, but we had to turn away many new businesses and, and reduce the number of new clients that we could accept this year. Um, we also, on the capacity building side, it took us about a decade to get to where we are today in terms of the methodologies and the expertise that we have in terms of delivering these services in a highly customized on-site way with our clients. And instead we had just a, a manner of days and weeks uh, to kind of pull everything over to a remote service provision methodology, leveraging new tools and um, shortening sessions, kind of spreading them out over time to make them more appropriate and accessible to our clients. And maybe just the last thing that I'll, that I'll mention, um, we have identified new areas as well where we needed to pivot in response to client needs. And I think very similar to what Roshan was saying, uh, we're not a, a philanthropic organization. We don't provide grants typically, we do provide debt financing. Um, but in this moment where so many of our clients have um, been incurring additional costs on top of very thin margins or delays in getting their products to market, we did feel like it was appropriate to um, kind of beef up an existing small grants program that we have that's typically focused on helping businesses design gender inclusion practices. Um, and we, we really have scaled that kind of five to 10 X over the last uh, six to nine months in order to help clients meet some of their urgent cash flow needs, um, whether it's buying soap, uh, you know, paying sick leave for their employees. And so um, I think, again, it's, it's the present of, presence of these businesses, which are, you know, they're not nonprofit, they're for-profit businesses operating in rural communities, but their presence is really a key um, added value and they're, they're really well positioned, I think, as Roshan was mentioning and seeing with his own business uh, to play a really key role in helping to respond to the crisis. Saskia, you're on mute. Okay, uh, sorry beginner's mistake. Um, but um, Kate, so what I hear you saying is really like in some ways your business model had to continue because it was just as essential as it was before the crisis. Um, so many of the things of just continuing to lend to ag businesses was just still going on in the same way. But indeed, you did have to change things like remote uh, capacity building services, um, that it is also more difficult to due diligence organizations and thereby you actually yeah, couldn't take on new investees at some point. Well, you probably did some, but not all. Um, so these are a couple of things that I hear. Um, and I do wonder, and maybe we can discuss that also in the second segment, what of those things you think are here to stay? So we'll take that for the, for the second round of questions. But um, with that, um, Lakshmi, I'd love to also hear um, uh, about you and um, how you know social business actually had to um, adapt during this time. And of course, compared to Rude, you know social business is a more an agnost sector agnostic um, uh, investor. So would love to hear actually how you felt also that it impacted other sectors since ag may um, be very specific. Lakshmi, I'll hand over to yeah. you. Thanks, Saskia. And so just as a quick introduction, uh, you know, social business, we make investments in very small, uh, very, uh, yeah, very small social businesses, typically between 200 to $200,000 to 1 million in revenue, small companies across the globe uh, in Latin America, Africa, and in India, just to sort of give you the context. Um, let me answer your question in two folds, Saskia. I think there's one aspect of, you know, just to enhance what Roshan said, what we saw in our portfolio with our social businesses, um, and given especially they're very, very diverse, we saw the crisis hit them in very different ways, right? So with agriculture, business was usual, it was, was as usual with some disruptions in the supply chain, but then we had education companies that went from revenues to zero revenues overnight. Literally all the schools were closed, no income coming in, you know, vocational training schools, et cetera. So 
complete spectrum. And then we had we have other sectors, say like healthcare, which was in between, where you saw dips of, of, of revenues anywhere between, I would say, 20 to 60 percent. So we really got an entire spectrum of social businesses to work with. Um, and when we spoke to them, I know much like what uh, Kate alluded to, we did the same thing. You know, we, we spoke to all our uh, businesses in depth. We conducted a needs assessment. And what came out of our needs assessment was uh, a couple of things. One is we set up our COVID relief facility. And I use the word facility deliberately and not fun because the feedback we got was, yes, we need capital. You know, finance is super important, but we need more is what our social businesses told us. So one leg of our um, the facility was definitely finance. And you know, here it goes to how we changed. We never do grants. It was one time we had to think on our feet, change of the fundamental, the fundamental way we approach things and say, okay, loans, that's not what these businesses need. We need to put a grant facility in place. The second aspect um, is what I would call capacity building because we spend enormous amount of time with these entrepreneurs to just help them think through their cash needs, think through how much cash they had and how, how long they could survive for that and literally do scenario planning for them, looking out three months, six months, 12 months. So this is nothing to do with you know, giving them money per se, but this is really more capacity building. And the third element, which was actually uh, super interesting to, to me too, I mean, it was not something that I had thought of before we set up the needs assessment, which was peer-to-peer -peer connections. I'm not, I'm not using the word learning, I'm using the word peer-to-peer -peer connections. What we realized that was that a lot of these entrepreneurs were very lonely during this crisis and it really helped them to just connect with somebody else who was going through the same challenges and, and pain. And, and I can see Rosh nod his head uh, and I'm sure he can, he, can, uh, he can attest to that as well. So we had a couple of you know, what we call bar camps, exchange uh, mechanisms within country, across countries. And the entrepreneurs all came back and said that was super helpful. So I think that was another key pillar to our um, COVID facility. In terms of YSP itself, some of the things which we had to change, I would, I would almost bucket them into three groups. One was strategic, which I just sort of just mentioned, you know, we went to doing grants um, and an equally important aspect is impact. We work with social businesses and we don't necessarily work with the direct beneficiaries that these social businesses work with. However, during our entire COVID effort and our COVID facility, I would say we also pivoted. We sat down at the desk with the entrepreneurs and said, okay, how can we use you as a channel to reach these end beneficiaries and vulnerable communities? So while it has always been an indirect consequence of our work you know, over the past eight years, during COVID, it became a very direct consequence. So that I think is was a very strategic shift we made. Operationally, of course, you know, we went from uh, meeting with entrepreneurs to getting on phone calls and, and all of that, which I think everybody else went through. Um, what I would highlight here is very close relationships that we, you know, we built and what I would call um, we, we came to rely on. So that was very important from, uh, for us operationally. And second is just super quick to move. I think in two months or three months, my entire my team did work that would have typically taken them an entire year. I have no idea how they did it, so kudos to them. But that was also, I think, operationally quite a change for us. And finally, um, it's a bit of a touchy feely thing, but I want I really want to call it out. I would say values. Um, I think the crisis was one time professionally, personally, institutionally. I think we faced ourselves and said, what values do we adhere to? What is it that we would want to work till 11 p.m. in the night for? Is it a PowerPoint deck or is it a way that I structure some legal contract to get the money into the countries, which is just equally hard? So yeah, so that I hope uh, it just gave you a flavor of some of the work that uh, Unisocial Social Business did with our entrepreneurs. Fantastic, Lakshmi. I think that uh, that was a nice summary. So really pivoting, well, actually adapting our business model at Unisocial Social Business with grants, uh, helping with scenario planning, the peer-to-peer -peer connections that you mentioned, um, getting shit done within a very short period of time, and finally, 
making sure that actually the COVID crisis in some ways reminded all of us um, of our values. So I think those are a couple of really interesting takeaways I see. Rebecca, I'd like to actually come to you now. Obviously, you're uh, now coming from the perspective of the funder in turn of the organizations that um, that were just speaking um, and, and would love to, you obviously have a very good overview of the impact investing space, of the philanthropy space, and um, particularly with the principles. I'd love to hear how you feel, um, again, COVID has impacted the work of Greenwood Place, um, but of course, also from what you hear, um, uh, yeah, principles themselves saying how this is actually impacting their giving, impacting mm -hmm. their social investing, et cetera. Rebecca. Thank you, Saskia. So just by um, background to Greenwood Place, we're a collective of family foundations, effectively. So we operate as an advisory service to some philanthropists. Mainly what we do is we run foundations for um, eight families. We have another 10 clients that we advise in their philanthropy and impact investing. So that's the kind of that's the kind of space. Um, so we do get some overview, particularly in Europe, about what people are doing and how they are, how they're adapting. In terms of our giving, um, we, I guess we did change quickly. So we adapted, we, we listened, um, we, work, we directly fund 75 um, organizations. So some social enterprises, some with a mixed revenue model, um, some a few that are purely humanitarian um, work, but they all pivoted. And I guess the key thing that we learned really early on in, our, in the crisis was the strength of our partners' values, um, just how they were connected to the people that they served and how they changed. Um, we changed our processes so we adapted what we did. So we, I mean, um, we work with both Unisocial Business and Root Capital. So you saw, we kind of basically kind of said, right, okay, let's not worry about milestones now. Let's just kind of make sure that we're doing things, other things that we should do together, other things that we should do differently. And we did that with everybody we work with on different levels and at different scales. Um, so we pivoted, we kind of said, well, we flexible. What we found really hard was we didn't bring on any new partners. So we doubled down with the people that we already work with. We found from a client perspective, from those people whose money we're responsible for, some of them doubled their giving this year, won 4X their giving this year very quickly. And we felt that what we needed to do was be able to use that flexibly and fast, because we knew that Things would change and you know it makes sense to keep powder dry for next year but actually there was stuff that needed to happen right then so people needed to people needed to eat businesses needed to keep the doors open so they could keep paying wages so that um, things could continue so we did that really quickly um, but we found it very hard to take on new organizations that we could work with we found due diligence very difficult find it very difficult to get out to the field, basically impossible to get to some places. So all these very practical challenges that we're trying to, we're struggling with now, um, uh, you know, were incredibly difficult early on. Yeah, I can imagine. And maybe uh, already sort of turning now the, into the second round, Rebecca, I'll actually ask you um, how this is now sort of affecting also the way that you're thinking about your work going forward. And I know you also mentioned to you, like you also mentioned to me, like, oh, like it's been it's been a crazy year. So thinking about the future is difficult. I don't know how uh, over the weekend uh, you you've been starting to think about this, or if you feel like, hey, we still need to focus on on COVID at this stage. We can think about how COVID learnings will impact our business going forwards for future shocks. So yeah, no, we talked about when we were doing our prep call, Saskia and I, we talked about how very tired we all were. Um, <laughs> and I think the first couple of months of COVID was so exhausting because you're really trying to deal with an, on, an unfolding emergency where you don't know quite what is happening next and you're pushing the tide back. Um, and that is not a good place to be because obviously we can't, you know, you can do little bits, but you can't entirely stop the tide. Um, so thinking about the future it, it is what we're trying to do now in the office. Um, 
And the, the great thing about philanthropy, so philanthropy giving is, is like magic money, you know, so it can kind of plug gaps, it can try things out that aren't possible with um, more structured finance. So we're trying to do that. Um, we're trying to encourage innovation and we're trying to um, use our money to allow people to do things that they couldn't do otherwise. So whether that is taking your, if you've got it, uh, we're working with one education business that has taken their work completely online and looking at different demographic groups. So how can they, how can they take their work um, downstream to even lower income people. Um, how can they do that long term without, you know, so that's going to be more of a mixed revenue model. So just helping people think through how they can adapt their business to what is going to be a, a horrible next year, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, but just to make sure that the people they exist to serve are kind of going to manage. So we're having those conversations very actively now. Mm -hmm. um, and really trying to think into what can we do to shore up our partners um, and also not to close the doors so we can carry on building, building from building our kind of network of people that we're working with. And Rebecca, perhaps just maybe one uh, one follow up question before I move back to Kate and, and uh, Lakshmi and, and, and Rashan also. Um, so how do you actually see, I mean, like 2020 has been a year where a lot of, let's say, philanthropic funding, government funding, um, you know, impact investing funding indeed has been made available because mm -hmm. of, we were a little bit in crisis mode. How do you see 2021 shaping up? I do see a little bit of a cliff uh, ahead in yeah. terms of um, philanthropic and impact investing funding, how do you see that with your overview? So uh, in the UK, domestically, government made available money to um, social organizations. That money has to be spent by March and then it goes away. This is so unhelpful <laughs> because the problems continue. Um, and and what you end up with is you're you're kind of trying to get cash out the door quickly as an organization where actually you need it in Q3 next year. I mean, as best you can predict. Um, so we are we are kind of changing our from our point of view, we're saying, OK, so we can let's rebudget quarterly with you. Let's see where you need to go and where money needs to be used. So that's one thing um, from our clients giving perspective. Um, one doubled um, their giving and has pledged to do the same next year. We had a big chunk of cash that we gave away once. That's not being repeated. That was a very kind of immediate heartfelt response to what can I do this year? And I imagine that has happened all over the world. Um, our longer term kind of giving will carry on, I think, at a higher level for a while. Um, because the people that we work with are very committed to the organizations they work with and, and you know want to make sure that everything kind of continues but I don't think that's forever so I look at so one of our clients um, gives dividend income to us to distribute they're not paying dividends you know so you know when you're making your staff redundant what do you do with your philanthropy so you've just got these things from a client's perspective for running bigger and more profitable businesses than any of us are and how they're thinking about um, their social responsibility. And I, I think for many, their key responsibilities to their employees. Mm -hmm. And I, I just know that over time that will affect all of us. Um, so that's not very that's not very hopeful. But what we can I mean we we have to we can go quickly, go now, um, and just um, just kind of keep doing what we can. I think. Yeah. No, I think that's helpful, Rebecca. And I think it's also a realistic view that I think we need to also come to terms with, um, uh, and how also let's say depending on where the investors come from, how that is. Also change the, the business models and the models of the impact investors and in turn of the entrepreneurs. So um, maybe coming to you then Lakshmi again, um, uh, sort of how do you, how do you feel um, the COVID crisis has made you know, social business um, ready for the future, for future shocks? Do you feel that uh, we are already set up for future shocks? Do you feel there's still a way to go? Um, or, or yeah, how do you how do you see things playing out? 
Um, I wish I could say we are all perfectly set. Next shock heads. I'm going to still. I'm going to have an eight-hour day. I really don't think that's where we are. Mm -hmm. uh, far from it, I would say. Um, where I think the positives is I think we we have proven we can be nimble. We have learned how to be nimble, uh, and these are very important learnings. The second, which is super important for us, as when we look at our investment thesis, and when I look at what you know, the companies in the pipeline are asking of us and our portfolio companies is a reinforced look at deal structures and not to have, okay, here's a loan, five years, 10% interest rate, EMI X every year, uh, sorry, every month, et cetera. I, th I don't think that's going to work anymore. Mm -hmm. That simply is not. So I think uh, deal structures, less standardized products, but more what I would like to call customized forms of capital uh, going very directly to the kind of um, use of funds that entrepreneurs need. So mm -hmm. we are spending a lot of time on that. You know, I can spend an hour talking about it, but very quickly, you know, thinking in terms of ticket sizes, thinking in terms of the interest rate, thinking in terms of the type of capital, and especially because at UNOS, we kind of blend very different kinds of capital. There's no sort of philanthropic, there's some um, which come... Which are, which are completely philanthropic, which can be used unrestricted, some are restricted, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then the, you have durations attached to it. So how do we best match for UNIS ourselves, the inflow of capital to the outflow as in you know, what we give out. And, and likewise for the companies that we work with, how do we help them manage that transition? So I think that is uh, going to be another, uh, an area where we have started working, but we really want to double down on that aspect. And the second um, and, and, of, and the next aspect that we're really working down is we're setting up uh, a technical assistance facility. And I know it's very common for the sector to use the term, you know, it's thrown around a lot. But what we, what we want to do now is actually take the technical assistance to the level of the enterprise. And, you know, just as an example, how if they want to redesign their shop floor, how do we get help companies do that? So, get technical assistance to the level of an enterprise and actually convince donors and investors in the market that that is actually valuable. Um, and linked to that is actually impact measurement. Um, it's going to be super important for us. We've set up an IMM framework now um, and be more diligent about ensuring the impact of our investments. So in the interest of time, I would just like to say, looking forward, um, I just thought of the question of resilience because that's the title of the session, right? Um, and to some make it catchy, I, I, and I think this is both for UNOS and I would say for our um, enterprises is, I think of resilience is coming from three different aspects. There's definitely financial resilience, which is fantastic on paper, but I think it's super hard to tell a company, hey, can you just keep 10% of your revenues in buffer in case of shock? It's not gonna happen, but yes. How can you better strengthen balance sheets how can you ensure that a certain access to capital to do uh, financial uh, to have to you know build financial resilience? The second, I'm actually going to call it a relationship resilience. I think what really came through for me, and I would uh, like as in for you know social business, and I would say for uh, social businesses, is the fact of the relationships we had and how some of them really came through. I mean, Rebecca just mentioned that very early on, like in March, and she was able to put together a facility that you know, both Root, Unisocial Social Businesses and Acumen actually availed of. And that was just a, out, you know, a byproduct of a very long standing relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, that was just the first amount of money that came in. And then when we reached out to our investors and our donors and said, here is what we want to do a food program in India. We want to do a program for women in India. We were able to find the money. So I think this relationship resilience for us as donors or for suppliers, for customers, for, for our social businesses, super, super important. And the third, uh, I would actually call it mental resilience, uh, maybe organizational resilience, if you may. These are tough times. And how do you keep sane? How, you know, this is, this is a question that entrepreneurs have asked me and I, I, I don't have an answer, but how do you keep your team motivated when you are not feeling motivated yourself? How do you tell your team, Everything is going to be fine when you don't know that everything is going to be fine. So building this mental resilience within an organization, I think is going to be super, super important going forward.
Thanks so much, Lakshmi. Um, yeah, just in the interest of time, I'll um, uh, I'll hand over to to Kate. Also, I'm um, just uh, would love to hear. I mean, like one of the things specifically you mentioned is that it was really tough for you to make new investments during this time, but it seems that COVID is here to stay, right? So, how are you going to be able to adapt to this? Um, would love to hear hear your thoughts, and then obviously qu quickly then finish with Rasham before I want to want to be able to ask a couple of questions still from the audience if possible. Okay, great. So, COVID is here to stay certainly, and unfortunately, um, we are expecting, especially in agriculture, significant shocks from climate change and and other crises that are still to come. And so, um, I think from from the investment side, maybe I'll start there. Uh, digital will be uh, a big piece of it for us because, um, you know, there, there are lots of locusts, lots of flooding in East Africa this year that have wiped out bridges. And so not being able to visit our clients face to face is something that for many reasons could continue. And so we have been fleshing out kind of new policies and systems to allow us to do more remote due diligence and also remote monitoring so that we can uh, feel comfortable with our investments and, and the risk management piece, even if we're not able to actually go and sit with the clients in the office. Mm -hmm. And I think to echo Lakshmi, you know, lending will always be a relationship business. And so the fact that the relationships may now be more and more via Zoom does not take that away or weaken those relationships. We just need to think of new ways to build the relationships and, and kind of keep them going because we, we do want to add more businesses to our portfolio. We, we do want to be able to grow and, and we can't count on that face-to-face -face visit anymore as the way of, um, of bringing people in. Mm -hmm. On the capacity building side, you know, it's interesting. We, we just started last year, a small pilot around digital agriculture extension in Rwanda. And it's basically sending SMS or voice messages to farmer members of some of the coffee cooperatives that we work with there, really in response to climate change. So the original intention was to strengthen the ability of the cooperative to provide appropriate agronomic advice, given that maybe it's raining too much or too little or it's too hot. And so how do you kind of adapt to the normal on-farm practices that you would be applying uh, during this one week in March to the realities of climate. But when COVID hit, it was actually the only service we were able to continue immediately. Kind of the next day, we shut down travel. Um, you know, we significantly changed our operations, but that digital service was still able to continue. And we were able to pivot it as well to include some COVID-19 messaging um, in response to some of our client requests. And so we really do see both kind of for ourselves as Root Capital and also for our clients, digital tools being a, a critical part of reaching large number of farmers and businesses located in rural areas and putting the right information into their hands so that they can make decisions in, in the face of these various crises. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, Kate. I think, yeah, digital due diligence obviously is going to, and, and also support is definitely going to be something that is going to be a standard going forward. So um, thanks for those thoughts. And, and then finally, Roshan, maybe in, in like a couple minutes, um, tell me about you. I mean, you're the entrepreneur here. Does this now mean you're going to prepare for future shocks by like putting a big side bank account with lots of money so you'll be ready for the next crisis? Or how are you going to be able to do that? How are you going to think about like what types of investments you want to get um, in the future? How are you dealing with this question? I, I so wish I could do what you just said, uh, Saskia and I. <laughs> but, but being a social entrepreneur, the way we think is, hey, we have we got $10,000 in the bank, you know, let's go work with 100 more waste pickers, right? I mean, other than keeping it as, as a reserve. Uh, that's that's the way most social entrepreneurs work. They they want to maximize the impact. Uh, but I think it's it's still important to have some reserve, I think. But, you know, that's at least the lesson we have. But I don't know how long we'll continue to have that, um, I, I don't know, come, gumption to keep that in the bank. I don't know how much. Uh, but coming back to uh, one of the things that I've learned, um, I mean, this was, I think, uh, very well mentioned by Lakshmi, Rebecca, and Kate, everybody, uh, is that, you know, it's very, very critical to have the right kind of team. I mean, I don't mean to say the employees as a team, uh, you know, that you don't need a shock to tell you that you need a right team there. Uh, although, you know, how well are their values aligned with yours kind of get tested during these times. And it's good to know who you don't want to lose at all, uh, come what may. But, but when I mention, mention team, I, I mean to say, 
who are the clients who stay with you and who are kind of support you of you right you you want to kind of build on such clients in future and more importantly i think at least to me um, you are investors like do you have that institutional kind of investors who tell you rather you know when when it was covid in april and may you know we did not lay off a single person we said everybody take say pay cut everybody gets less salary but we continue as much as we can but to be very frank we would have folded and i wouldn't have been be speaking here um if we did not have the right kind of support you know uh, people at unus social business fund stood with us and then said hey you've been doing the work which matters to you matters to us as well that impact matters to us those values matter to us we're going to stand with you and make sure you don't lo- you don't lose right you don't lose in this pandemic and this shock mm-hmm. it's very very important to find that kind of a partner uh, whenever you scale up it's very very critical to find the investors whose values align with you and who say that impact first is what we believe in and we want this entrepreneur to survive um if you don't have one i say please go ahead and find that institutional investor or an individual investors people like saskia and lakshmi here and who stand with you not just to you know kind of let you survive the grant you guys gave us is very critical otherwise we wouldn't have been we wouldn't have survived but also to come up with you know when we came to you guys with saying hey we have done uh, some grocery kits uh, distribution to 200 base pickers they're not going hungry can we do anything you said let's take it up to 6000 right i mean i i i was hoping to hear 1000 but you said 6000 right so this is the kind of you know uh, partners you want to find if you don't have one i think hopefully the next shock is not not uh, you know around the year or you know, around the corner so you have enough time to go ahead and find those people who align their values with your values and then who you, who let you fight the battle uh, by standing next to you right that is very critical uh, that's what um, it could be entrepreneurs it could be investors it could be clients it could be teammates find them and hold them hold them close to you that's the biggest lesson i have had Fantastic. Thanks so much, Roshan. Um, so I'd like to actually now move a little bit to a couple of uh, Q&As here. So please, um, dear people in the room, um, if you haven't already, um, add your questions to the chat box and then I'll be able to pose them um, to the panelists. If you have a question to somebody specifically, please just add the names um, so, we, so we can be specific. But let me just jump in with a couple of the questions that we have here. So for example, we hear from Christi- Christiane Schäfer, um, how can peer-to-peer learning be strengthened to scale? Meaning, I believe, how can you really scale up peer-to-peer learning? I don't know if anyone in the panel has some thoughts about that. And with that, maybe let me add an additional question and then we can um, uh, answer those. Um, so we hear here from Looney Libs. Um, also, now that we, have, um, that we have months of experience operating within a pandemic, what comes next? Does business and investing go back to normal in 2021 or does all this zooming and lack of jet fuel change the future? So I think we've discussed some of that, but if there are any additional points you want to share, um, again, the peer-to-peer learning, how can we scale that up? And again, like what's next? Um, if you want to share, um, whoever feels free, feels um, they want to. I can, I, can, I can jump in a little bit. Mm-hmm. This is, we have not, we've not focused on this yet um, in a major way at Greenwood Place, although we kind of feel like it's part of what we ought to do for our broader community. Um, I'm part of um, an, the Ashoka Europe um, community and the team there, somebody, one of the fellows set up a WhatsApp group and that has been really helpful, actually people sharing very practical things and then um, uh, over the, as Black Lives Matter became larger, somebody kind of put their hand up and said, should we get together and talk about some of some of what we're seeing in our organizations and how we should be thinking about this. So then we've had a couple of informal, um, just kind of conversations with the team. And I think those things um, be, it, are really helpful as social entrepreneurs to just have other people to bounce ideas off mm-hmm. and to kind of share with, even though nobody knows exactly the answers, people have different parts of it and people have tried it. Um, we have, um, we regularly within Greenwood Place hold kind of community gatherings. So about every six weeks, we have a kind of conversation on something and get people together. And that's an opportunity for people to talk. But, we, but I think what Ashoka have done, which is this no agenda WhatsApp group, um, where people can create their own spaces and talk about things that they're worried about and create little groups, I think is really helpful. And more of that, I think we could do um, as um, 
as, as a community and particularly as investors, where we've got an overview of a lot of people doing things, I think we're in a place where we could help with that. So basically, uh, peer-to-peer exchange through just simple WhatsApp groups, yeah. either driven by the entrepreneur themselves or potentially the investor or the network that they're part yeah. of. Yes, not even, not driven, I'd say at all. Here's a WhatsApp group. Add, add to it what you want. And then um, people ask questions. I mean, you see what I've seen is a couple of people just kind of saying, I need some mentoring here and, and people jumping in to help with that. So those very practical things have been... Um, just emerged I guess yeah yeah and we're hearing also from Looney Lives here again uh, in the last few years most of my entrepreneur cohorts have created whatsapp groups so that seems to be one of the things that definitely works and is very simple in that sense um any other thoughts on the peer-to-peer -peer connections I don't know Rashan from your perspective or uh, Lakshmi Kate is there anything particularly you would like to point out well I I, I don't know uh about the scale is is answered or not but uh, one of the workshops that again i was part of um you know social business fund uh, entrepreneurs all came together last year this was before pandemic and we all connected we you know we got to know each other really well for in those uh, those two days workshop but then what what helped us you know eventually when we had issues with some legal complications uh, about how the grant money was received or maybe you know how uh, do we, you know, how do we go about getting any additional funding that we need for, you know, impactful philanthropic work we were doing and so on. I got, uh, those, you know, I, those connects really helped. I could just, you know, message them, connect with them and then say, but, you know, to be very frank, for the first, maybe even the 70% of the time we're talking about how difficult the situation has been for each of us. And just, you know, hearing from the other side saying that, hey, you know, we are on the same boat. Uh, we're trying to figure out here is what I did. Here's what you can do. It helps a lot. Uh, whether that's you already tried or not, I think, you know, just making sure there's a cohort of entrepreneurs who can dial each of them, each one, each other um, at a short notice, that definitely helps. Yeah. It need not be a huge network. It can be a very small one, but that is very critical to have. Fantastic. Um, I'm also seeing here as another follow-up question, also again from Looney. So um, if others also have questions, feel free to add them to the chat box again. So um, don't be shy. So Looney is asking, are the investors seeing examples of adaptations of business models that have actually grown the business? So I think maybe if you could share some examples of companies that have actually in this crisis taken it as an opportunity and have grown significantly, that would be an interesting contribution here. Lakshmi, go ahead, yeah. you're raising your I hand. I think we, we did see a couple of, um, couple of companies like that in our portfolio, Looney. So one is a company that did um, that does herbs and spices, and they fundamentally they had a B2B model. So they worked with restaurants, they worked with larger, you know, canteens and the like in Latin America, and clearly all of them shut down, and continue to stay shut down, and they pivoted to a B2C model. So that was, you know, and they, they're back to 80% of their revenues. They just did a monthly review last week. So complete pivot, um, same product, they just found a different customer uh, segment. So I think that was super cool. Uh, another one sort of from the cost side, uh, there was a company in our portfolio who's been thinking forever to uh, whether they needed a warehouse in Bogota. They're actually based in Medellin, which is a smaller city um, in uh, Colombia. And there was this follow-up question, do we make or buy in Bogota? And the entrepreneur finally actually found the time to run a proper financial analysis, you know, we did support them with getting the right expert in, but then actually find the data, run the analysis and said, no, I don't think we need one in Bogota. We have enough capacity. We need to max it out. But the hypothesis going in was we want to do it. And we had been telling the entrepreneur for quite some time that you need to think before you actually run with it. So yeah, cost side and um, revenue side. Mm -hmm. And maybe one more thing also I would add um, in terms of growth, um, Kate, and let me know if you have anything more. There's also another company we've invested into in, in Brazil who has been giving out vocational training loans. And because people had time during COVID because they were not allowed to go to work, um, the um, let's say the requests for loans have quadrupled of this company and they actually had to raise significant capital during the crisis to be able to keep up with the demand because key people wanted to use the time to up their uh, skills and um, yeah, and continue retraining for future other jobs that I found interesting as well. But Kate, do you have any more growth stories that may be relevant for you? Sure, I'll just add one, which is um, 
you know, I think it varies so much just depending on the, the sector that you're in and the size of the business and where you're operating. But one thing that we've seen that's been really inspiring is, um, especially in South America, which was kind of coming up to the coffee harvest when things really got bad and, and borders shut and uh, even local travel was shut down. Typically the coffee harvest relies a lot on seasonal workers that come from different countries and kind of follow the, the coffee harvest as it goes. And so many of our clients were able to organize um, kind of small worker pods of people that would work on each other's farms. And it was, it was a way of building community, of course. And it also strengthened the relationship between the cooperatives and the members um, so that they were actually able to, to buy more of the coffee that was coming from these farmers rather than having selling to kind of other middlemen, et cetera. And so um, that was kind of a nice, both community building and a very functional business purpose um, kind of learning or insight that came out of this. Fantastic, great. Thanks, Kate. So um, Tanushree, if you can uh, do me the favor, I'd like to, in terms of closing now, um, since we're running out of time, would love to actually launch a final poll and actually said, um, ask all of you in the room. Um, nope, there we go. Yeah, is your organization actually prepared for future shocks? Uh, now, after all of you, what you've heard, um, after all of what we've been discussing today, um, learning from other either entrepreneurs, funders, or also impact investors, how they're now starting to adapt to the crisis, do you feel that you're ready? So A is not ready to think about the shocks, still dealing with COVID, uh, starting to think about future shocks while implementing COVID lessons, fully prepared. Those are the options right now. And I'll ask you to just uh, quickly uh, give your voice here. Perfect. Well, I guess uh, the middle ground is the one that's winning here as we speak, starting to think about future shocks while implementing COVID lessons. But we do also have a significant amount with 26% that is just saying, guys, we're still dealing with a crisis right now. Uh, give me time to actually think about the future. But big majority with 53% is actually starting to think about the future shocks while implementing the COVID lessons. And I think that that's also what we're hearing from the panelists right now. Um, and of course, we are still in the middle of this crisis. So um, I think actually still working on that um, is also probably the, the, th the timely thing to do right now to continue focusing on COVID for a bit more. So um, I'm seeing we're running out of time but I wanted to say a big, big thank you to all the panelists. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion um, and I hope it's been interesting for the audience as well. Um, and um, I think we've learned everything from, um, yeah, how uh, entrepreneurs like Roshan are um, um, adapting, making sure that they actually really focus on the impact has been helpful for their business model as well. We've been learning uh, from Lakshmi um, that values uh, really show in a crisis. I, I found that that was a really important point. Um, we um, learned from uh, Kate that how it is, how important it is uh, going to be to adapt uh, to this crisis through things like um, uh, uh, let's say digital due diligence and also support um, and also from uh, we've learned from Rebecca that obviously well the um, the we, there are a couple of amazing philanthropists that are doubling down but then of course also the future may be somewhat bleak um, uh, so I think we have a we've had a really interesting discussion today and um, please for anyone that's interested in any follow-up questions to the panelists you can reach out um, to the IntelliCap team and um, to make the connection to the various panelists and yeah with that thank you so much and um looking forward um to being in touch with everyone bye bye from this bye -bye. panel <laughs> see you in other sessions at sun Cove.